This is part two of the history of the Victor Talking Machine Company. As I finished in the previous video saying that Frank Seaman and the Columbia Graphophone Company started to work in cahoots to try to find a way to remove Johnson, and they took him to court for basically being a veiled copy of a Berliner gramophone record, which we know was illegal because it was a needle move by a groove. We didn't really have to look at the Zonophone because it did the same thing, but we're not going to go there because Columbia didn't go there because Frank Seaman was okay in their eyes. He was controllable to a degree. And so Berliner, who is out of the picture altogether, is just sitting there watching Johnson was taken to court. He battles in court. While all of these battles are going on, he's changed the name of the company. It's now an improved record manufactured by Eldridge Reeves Johnson. Consolidated's gone. Once the court case is over, it comes up with some very, very interesting uh, answers. Johnson goes through the whole court case pretty much unscathed, except for one thing. He cannot use the word gramophone. And so he scraps the word gramophone from his list and walks out of that courtroom pretty much the victor because he won. He defeated the powerful interest. And so his next records had a very unique name. They were called Victor Records, manufactured by Eldridge Reeves Johnson. And it's all well and good But he was still being harassed. There were still problems. Zonophone was still there. Columbia was still there. And so throughout uh, 1900, Johnson kept trying to make improvements. And he did. And he came up with the 10-inch Victor Monarch record, manufactured by, of course, Eldridge R. And then in the latter part of 1901, Johnson and Berliner pool their patents and create an entirely new company. And it's called the Victor Talking Machine Company, of which this is their first label. The Victor Monarch record, manufactured by the Victor Talking Machine Company of Camden, New Jersey. Although much of their offices are in Philadelphia, they use Camden, Camden as their home base, at least in all their advertising. Now, another thing that's very, very important with all of this, and that is, as I'm moving records here, uh, <clears throat> once Johnson gets into the business, and with the blessings of Berlin, he can take on Zonophone, and Zonophone flounders. And Columbia does not have disc records. They're purely a cylinder company at this point. But when they came out with their new industry, the Victor Talking Machine Company, something brand new was coming. And that has to deal with what Berliner had done uh, almost two years earlier. When Berliner had founded the Berliner Gramophone Company in the United States, he started sending emissaries to various countries to start um, promoting the gramophone and creating industries there. And so you had a gramophone industry in Germany, you had a gramophone industry in Russia, you had a gramophone industry in England and in other areas as well. And Berliner uh, purchased the rights to a picture. 
And the picture uh, was done by an artist by the name of Frank Berard. And Francis Berard, actually. But, um, and it was a picture of a little terrier looking into a cylinder machine. And he tried to sell it to the, uh, the Edison Bell people in England, and they weren't interested. And so he happened to go into the gramophone company, and the head of the gramophone company was a fellow by the name of Barry Owens. And Barry Owens uh, was very, very bright, impulsive at times. And uh, Berard asked him that he wanted to use a uh, one of their new horns. He wanted to update a picture, and of course, uh, Owens said, what's the picture of? And he said, well, it's a picture of a little terrier looking into a, a, a Edison Bell cylinder machine. And Owen says, I'll tell you what, if you paint in our new uh, gramophone into the picture and replace that Edison Bell cylinder machine, I'll buy the painting from you. And so Rod was delighted. He couldn't get anyone to buy the picture. And, uh, well, history was made. All of a sudden, he came back with the picture with the fox terrier looking into a machine it had never seen before, but that didn't matter. Berliner went out right away and got copyrights on that image. He was going to use it for his Berliner, but of course, his Berliner business was gone by 1900. Johnson, in early 1902, adopts that picture. And if you think about it, this is a new company that really didn't have an image, an image to back it up, an image that people could say, ah, this is the Victor talking machine company. But once this image is inscribed into the industry completely, it becomes inseparable from it. And this is the first label that they used on their records with that image. You'll notice it's kind of similar to the previous, the Victor Monarch record, kind of squiggly there, but instead, there, right in front of you, was that picture. There's that picture of the fox terrier. Looking into that one. You might say, in a sense, the rest is history because the Victor Company skyrockets and it takes over the industry. It is the most successful, uh, profitable talking machine company in the world. It'll make more money than Edison, more money than Columbia, and definitely much more money than Zonophone. In fact, in time, the Victor Company would own Zonophone. The Victor Company would own parts of HMV in Europe. The Victor Company would own parts of everything. It became the major company. Now, as time would go by, and I don't have examples of this later stuff, but just to explain, eventually the Victor Company will be bought by RCA and be known as RCA Victor. And of course, that's a whole nother chapter of which I'll talk about another time. But this has been the history of the Victor Company just to try to explain how it came about. I simplified it some. There's a lot more to the story. I mean, you could spend two hours talking about it. But nonetheless, I hope you enjoyed it.